Hey, welcome back to the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. I'm Darren, I'm your host, and today I've got another great guest, Mr. Sebastian Basert. He is the CEO and founder of Fogo Premium Hardwood Lump Charcoal. I can't wait to talk to Sebastian about how the company was started and where it's going. I'll be right back with Sebastian of Fogo Charcoal. Smoking, grilling, getting hot and hotter. Hey all, I want to welcome back Inkbird Products as a sponsor of the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. Inkbird makes one of the best Wi-Fi 4 Pro barbecue thermometers that I've ever seen out there. The IBBQ4T is 100% rechargeable USB. 4 Pro Wi-Fi enabled barbecue thermometer and it usually sells for under a hundred dollars. Check it out the link below for the Inkbird Wi-Fi IBBQ 4T 4 Pro barbecue thermometer. Welcome back Inkbird products. Welcome back to the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. I got another special guest, Sebastian Bersert, and he is the CEO and founder of Fogo Charcoal. If you uh, cook on charcoal. Um, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with the Fogo Premium Hardwood Charcoals. Um, they've been around for a few years now, and I'm excited to get uh, get uh, Sebastian on here to talk about how he got the business started. So, Sebastian, I know I just told him who you are, so let's kind of back up and tell me who you are, where you live, and all that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, really appreciate it. Um, you know, I'm always, always game to talk barbecue. Uh, <laughs> thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I mean, um, basically, um, I pretty much, uh, started in charcoal. Well, who I am, right? Uh, first, well, actually, so I, I am German. I was born in Germany. Um, um, and then I, I went to college in, in the United Kingdom and that's where I met my wife about, um, I don't know, like 17 years ago. It's actually our 14th wedding anniversary today. And, um, and uh, basically through her, I was sucked into this like uh, barbecue industry because her dad makes uh, like this all natural charcoal in El Salvador. And uh, um, about 10 years ago, so they asked me if I wanted to, you know, kind of join the family company, come on board and kind of grow this thing into something bigger. So when you, when you first met your wife in college, so you were going to school in London, um, at the London, was it the, uh, London, uh, business school? What, what was the name of the yeah, school? London school of economics? Yeah. Okay. And you were both economics majors, correct? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I mean, it's all very theoretical, right? Um, you know, <laughs> nothing, nothing that I'm really using nowadays. Um, you know, really, I mean, I do, I do everything, you know, this is still a small company. I think that's probably the number one a misconception. A lot of people have, you know, I think we've done a really good job of branding and projecting, um, you know, Fogo out there. And people think this is like this big corporation, you know, sort of like Royal Oak or Kingsford or something like that. But really, you know, I think in the, in the U S we have like 10, 11, 12 employees, you know, it's a small company. And that's the reason I have, I asked you to come on is because like I told you before we got started, you know, you, you seem to be an approachable person. You're not um, a big corporation like Royal Oak or, you know, Kingsford where I can't, you know, I have to get a hold of some CEO somewhere and he's not going to want to talk. You know, he'll put me in touch with some management <laughs> guy, you know, way down the pike. But um, so I think what I want, I, I, I want, yeah, I want to start when, though. I want to go back a little bit though, because uh, I want to kind of, we'll walk down that aisle, but I want to talk about when you met your wife in college and you guys decided, okay, we're going to get married. Did you guys have any inkling that you were going to start this business or, or what were your plans when you were in college? No, I mean, um, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I was probably a little bit of a late starter. I actually, uh, we got, we got married, uh, you know, super young, right out of college. I, di I didn't even have a job at the time. Um, I got lucky just like a week or two before we got married. Uh, I got, I got a job offer from uh, Cadbury Schweppes, uh, you know, like the chocolate and uh, right. soda manufacturer. And uh, I worked uh, Cadbury's as a uh, supply chain manager for like 
two, three years. Um, and that was like before I went into the charcoal business, basically. Now, so, you know, was that? was that in London or was that? in? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In London. Yeah. Okay. So you guys stayed in London for a little while before you yeah. decided to, uh, to get into the family business. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. I, I'm just kind of trying to start, we'll start kind of where you are and then where, where we, where you are now. Um, so when you, you worked that for a couple of years and then you were approached by your in-laws and said, Hey, do you guys want to, you know, check out and see if you want to work this business? Is that kind of how it happened? Yeah. I mean, basically, <laughs> uh, a, a lot of personal information, right? But I mean, basically, um, you know, I married fairly young. I think I was 22 when I married, um, two years later, my wife was pregnant uh, with our first kid. Uh, you know, I was 24. She was, she's 25. Uh, she was 25 and so uh, my wife being from central america uh, his hispanic culture you know the the family bonds like super close right and so she was like i'm gonna be a young mom you know i i, I want to be close to my family i want to be close to my own mom and you know i i was a 24 year old you know the the world <laughs> was my oyster the world is open to me so she said oh you want to move to el salvador for like a year maternity leave or something yeah, you know, where, where do I sign up? You know, I mean, I probably never overplanned or never, uh, um, you know, I wasn't a person that was too worried, you know, about like, how are we going to pay for this? You know, um, what am I going to work? I just figured, I mean, and I, I'm, I, I come from no wealthy background or so, you know, like I, I'm a single child. My, my parents actually was born in, I was born in East Germany, um, you know, former communist Germany. Um, you know, like there's no money basically, but like, I guess I always fig just figured I'll make it work. You know, I didn't, I didn't overthink right. it. Well, that's, um, a good, that's a good attitude to have though. I mean, you're not always worried about something that you know, something's going to happen and, um, you know, and you could always make it work. So that's, that's a good attitude yeah. to have. I was ready for the adventure. And, um, and actually the first thing we did was when we, um, uh, when we got to El Salvador was I put up a, a, like a kiosk of, um, I don't know, when you go to these like cruise ships or malls, you see these like uh, what they call like inch of gold, you know, these like gold chains that you buy like in a mall, mm -hmm. uh, buy a chain by the inch. And so I actually brought that concept to El Salvador. They didn't, they didn't have that back then. Um, but unfortunately it was 2007 and you know, the world economic crisis uh, just started hitting. Um, I started building that business and, and it worked actually really well. We had uh, lines around our kiosks uh, in the malls and people were just buying these chains. But then um, in early 2008, when uh, things kind of uh, took a dive and um, you know, countries like El Salvador depend a lot on remittances, remittances, you know, be, uh, money being sent from uh, uh, relatives abroad. And then once that dried up, you know, nobody, nobody was buying fashion jewelry anymore. You know, people were yeah. worried to put food on the table. And so that, that kind of tanked. And that's basically when I sat down one day with my father-in-law and they said, well, we got this charcoal thing. You know, people say it's good charcoal. Do you want to have a look at that? And I was like, well, I, I'm not doing anything else. You know, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> well, sometimes that's the best thing. We, you know, you kind of fall into stuff like that. And yeah. so what, when you came on board then, was he doing mostly wholesale? Was he selling mostly to locals? I mean, how, how was his distribution and, and the business set up when you came Yeah, I mean, so this is back in 2008. 2009 and um yeah it, it, it was it was just um private labeling for other companies um and yeah just exporting out of el salvador so one of the first projects that i had was okay how 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 do we get closer to the consumer you know um uh, go to the us um set up a business there or, or buy out a business you know some some existing small distributor or something and and you know uh, build our own brand basically and that's, that's pretty much what happened. So you decided to start the, the Fogo brand started in El Salvador or did you start it in, in Miami when you, you just decided to say, all right, we're going to go to the U S and, and start. Yeah, it was brand. simultaneously. Uh, I started developing it uh, in El Salvador and then um, I launched it in the U S in 2010, basically in Miami. So now let's pick up to where you, you started launching this in the U.S. and you, you came to the came to Miami and said, "All right, let's go." Yeah. What, what, what was the first thing you started doing? Well, so essentially, um, 
as I mentioned, initially we sold a uh, wholesale um, and, and, and kind of private labeled other people's uh, charcoal. And so we had a, a customer in Miami, a distributor, a very small distributor uh, um, um, back in 2008, 9, 10, and um, was an older gentleman. Um, I think he was 65 uh, in 2010. And so basically uh, I came to Miami and we sat down and basically, you know, the conversation came up man, you know, we're really hungry. You know, we want to grow this brand. We have good charcoal. We want to grow this into a bigger business. What's your, what's your plan? You know, do you want to work with us and, and buy it and distribute it? And he, he was basically, well, actually, I want to retire. I want to get rid of this thing. Um, <laughs> but, you know, if you, if, you, if, you, if you pay me off over, you know, the next couple of years, I'll give you all my existing clients and you get a, you get a jumping start. You know, you get, a, you get a running start, let's say. You don't start from zero. You know, I have a handful... Of customers and and basically the guy had um, like a lot of the uh, charcoal using restaurants in Miami he had sort of as customers and so kind of it kind of threw us right into actually threw us a bit of a curveball because you know I wanted to grow this brand go into retail and this guy was like okay here I have 50 restaurants that use charcoal and I was like what about any supermarkets no no supermarkets right now but these restaurants are buying every day you know and they're buying a good amount of charcoal and like okay so for, for the first couple of years, that was really our business, you know, just restaurants, restaurants, restaurants. Um, and, and, you know, it's good because it's good volume. It's very steady, you know, like a restaurant, the kitchen always has to be running. The charcoal always has to be burning. Um, if there's people coming in or not, you know, um, and it's, it's sort of, it gave us a good kind of foundation. And, um, and actually until, until before coronavirus hit, like I would say, you know, if you would have asked me in February, I would have told you still today, uh, like uh, the majority of our business is food service, like restaurants, you know, I would have said like 60% or so. And I know it's a question that's coming up later, but basically coronavirus has totally tipped this around. Um, now, you know, as of today, a business to restaurants is probably like 10% and retail is like 90% or so. Like restaurants have you know, I've had a terrible time, um, you know, as people no longer eat out, but eat at home, basically. Yeah, that I think that's messed up a lot of, it's some for the good, some for the bad. So, yeah. um, and some just totally different than what they were six months ago, that's for sure. So you, you kind of walked into a guy that had a business and took it over and had to kind of put your launch in the retail brand on the back burner. So you were just yeah. still wholesaling and selling it to the restaurants. Did you, did he have a established brand already that, that he was using and you guys just took it over? Is that how it was or? No, we, I, I brought the Fogo brand basically. Okay. Um, yeah. And it was just, you know, selling to the restaurants. That, that's a good start anyway, though, because you already got, you got, you know, a, you know, uh, customers that are using your product and you can say, yeah. Hey, this is restaurant quality right off the bat. Exactly. Yeah. Because that taught us be, a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah. And as you will see, as we continue talking about this, Really, and kind of shame on me, um, a lot of the photo story is not, there's no big strategy behind this or, you know, I don't know, like a guy, an investor that came and said, here's $5 million, build me a successful brand. A lot of this literally is, you know, being lucky, making the right steps at the right time, learning the right things at the right time and just sort of organically growing, you know, <laughs> the path of least resistance, let's say. Um, well, a, a lot of times businesses, you know, timing is the biggest thing. And then, like you said, you, you, you approach that distributor at the right time. He's ready to get out. Yeah. And it yeah. gave you a foothold to get started and, and, and establish Fogo in the restaurant. So let, let's talk about why Fogo is 100% lump charcoal, because I know that's one of the things you guys don't do briquettes. You don't do any other kind of uh, products. It's pretty much um, lump charcoal and different quality of lump charcoal. So let's start yeah. with that. Well, so, so essentially that's, that's the product that, you know, that I had that, you know, back in 2008, 2009, what we were saying, um, that's what my father-in-law said is what we have. Right. And that was really my first, uh, experience, uh, with this too. You know, that's probably around the time that I, I barbecued for the first time, grilled for the first time, uh, you know, burned and played around with charcoal for the first time. That's sort of, my experience um and then i i saw you know you know i guess that's where my uh, kind of um 
degree kind of helped a little bit, you know, uh, kind of being analytical and stuff. So I kind of went into the US market and tried to analyze a little bit, okay, what, what do people sell? Who are the big companies? Who are the com competitors? What are they selling it at and stuff like that? And I saw that Briquette is huge, you know, I think back in 2010, it was like 80% of the market of charcoal sales it was briquettes basically to the extent that if you say if you stop a random person on the street and tell them uh ask them kind of what comes to your mind when you say when i say to you the word charcoal they say it's basically they're talking to you about a briquette everybody like kingsford has made it so uh, synonymous you know their product with charcoal that that's what people are thinking about a kingsford uh white and blue bag pillow shaped briquette you know uh, you and lighter fluid that's what they're thinking <laughs> And lighter fluid to get it yeah. going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's half the reaction. Oh no, I don't use uh, charcoal because uh, that smell of lighter fluid, I can't stand it. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, uh, there's so much wrong with what he's just saying. You know, let me let me back up. <laughs> well, I think, you know, even the barbecue world has changed in the last 10 or 15 years to move away from that. Because I know back when I was younger and growing up, I mean, that's all you saw anywhere was yeah. Kingsford and, and lighter fluid. I mean, I grew up, I didn't grow up in a really, you know, big barbecue area. It was upstate New York, but every summer we have barbecues and we'd grill and, and make stuff, but it was always with briquettes and lighter fluid. And I can always remember that lighter fluid yeah. taste. Yeah. And I don't think it was till about 10 or 15 years ago when, you know, lump charcoal or even, you know, the traditional wood pit, you know, uh, barbecue really started to become more popular. So I yeah. think, yeah, I think you're right. Is everybody had that, you know, when you said charcoal, that's what they thought of. Yeah. Yeah. No, but so, I mean, why don't we sell a briquette? Um, I mean, essentially it's what you have when you make charcoal is you do have, you know, a lot of fines. Charcoal is brittle. So it breaks down into smaller pieces and stuff like that. And so normally once you have a very large scale operation of charcoal, you know, like, like, for example, very low, you want to be making a briquette because otherwise you, you're wasting all this, all these like crumbles and all these like uh, small pieces, it's just a waste. And so really briquette is a way of recycling. You know, they're taking all these broken lump charcoal pieces and, and giving it a second life essentially. Yeah, so yeah, that's pretty much, you know, how they started the, the briquette companies because it was something to do with the waste wood and sawdust. Yeah. And there's still, there's even, you know, I know like with Royal Oak and, and some of the other companies, they still use waste wood even in their, yeah. Um, lump charcoal they use construction debris and two by fours and they they burn it you know to make lump out of so because um, yeah. i found actual construction debris <laughs> in bags you know like you know roof ties and stuff like that and you're like you don't find that you know in a forest usually is a roof tie but uh, <laughs> but you know so yeah i mean I, I understand so you guys don't use any waste wood at all you're, you're pretty much using you know forest well, wood well, that, that is the interesting question, right? And uh, I get, and I'm really, that's probably the, the second question I usually get asked, you know, after, after we move past that awkward moment, what, char uh, charcoal is not a briquette, you guys are not Kingsford, and it doesn't have lighter fluid, <clears throat> it's all natural, it's like, wait, hold on a minute, like, are you chopping down rainforest? <laughs> it kind of <laughs> automatically moves into that. And so, so the thing that you need to understand about really any charcoal producer uh, in the world is that Charcoal is always like a, a product of recycling to some extent, right? Like wood is a far too precious uh, commodity, a far too expensive commodity that anybody would have a sort of, like nobody in the world that I know is, uh, that has a plantation of wood or, or, or goes into a forest and chops wood down to make charcoal out of it, right? Like if you have access to wood like that, you could be making beautiful tables or, or, or like flooring or, or any other thing that's going to yeah. pay you top dollars for that wood, <clears throat> right? And so, so whatever wood you have made into charcoal is always some sort of recycling, right? Um, and I think that that's a message, you know, none of the charcoal companies really talking en enough about because, you know, you get that uh, nowadays with, um, um, you know, more environmental sort of awareness, you get that question a lot. And I think we should all, as an industry, we should all be talking more about that, that really, um, you know, charcoal is not from virgin wood and virgin forest. You know, there's no tree chopped down to make into charcoal. Right. Like, 
they're not stripping the, the yeah. uh, rainforest to make charcoal. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like you said, if that doesn't make sense, you know, there would be more things they could use it for that, that would make them a lot more money, like yeah. you know, construction of housing, you know, housing and yeah. uh, you know, furniture or what have you. you yeah. know, char- yeah. Charcoal's way down on the bottom, so. Yeah. Uh, when I when I say scrap, what I'm talking about, like you know, when they rip down a house and and two by fours that were used in it, and, yeah. and that's that's what you get a lot here is what they do. They they yeah. knock a house down, and you know any of the wood that's left over from when they knock the house down, they'll they'll use that. Yeah. Charcoal, so yeah, I so I've heard that in the in the Ozarks here in you know Missouri, that's where a lot of charcoal is made here in the U.S. I've heard there's a lot of there's a lot of wood industry, right? So there there's big forests, and so that's what they're doing. They're making um, I don't know like door frames, window frames, um, you know, all kinds of stuff. Um, and but there's always sort of waste, right? Like pieces that maybe break, pieces that are not cut right. Um, also the bark and stuff like that. Which which actually to that to that point, there's there's a lot of wood that doesn't make very good charcoal. You know, yes, it's waste wood. Yes, it's sort of recycling, making it into charcoal. But is it necessarily a high quality good charcoal? Not really, you know, because bark is not great, uh, sort of as a raw material to make charcoal. And I think, you know, let's talk a little bit about Fogo. Uh, basically, our source of wood is the coffee plantations in El Salvador. Actually, there's two or maybe three big industries in El Salvador. Um, one is basically uh, cloth manufacturing, you know, like T-shirts and stuff like that. Um, uh, uh, then you have coffee plantations and then you have uh, like uh, sugar plantations, basically, you know, like uh, cane sugar and stuff like that. And so the way they grow coffee in El Salvador is under uh, shade trees. You know, uh, again, it's sort of not, El Salvador is not a, a very big country, you know, like Brazil or Colombia. So, you know, where they literally have industrial type of plantations with hybrid crops, uh, you know, that can, you know, grow in any weather under any sort of sun or shade and, and you know, on, on poor soil and stuff like that. But in El Salvador, it's more, it's almost like organic farming in a way, you know, it's on the, that original mountain slope, uh, very difficult to access terrain. Uh, and, and traditionally it's grown under a shade cover, uh, you know, of basically oak trees, basically. And those trees, that's basically where we get the wood from because these guys, these, these guys' business is the coffee. You know, they just care about making the best coffee in the world, award-winning coffee, and getting as much uh, harvest as possible, right? And so they're constantly looking at those shade trees and saying, okay, uh, I have the right amount of shade to make perfect coffee, or maybe I have too much shade, or maybe I need to plant a new shade tree, you know, because I don't have enough shade here. So they're actually doing the entire job for us. And then literally they just throw the wood away and they have their, you know, they sell it as firewood or or just have it removed basically. Because, you know, imagine it's so much wood at some point you don't know what to do with it. And so that's basically where we come in as partners and say, we'll, we'll buy that wood from you. You know, we can make that into charcoal. And that's, that's basically the, the story of Fogo. Um, you know, we, 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 go, we work with these coffee plantations and remove the, the shade cover on top of the coffee trees. So it's not made from coffee trees. I sometimes get that question. Oh, so it's made from coffee trees. No, no, the coffee trees are like little bushes. Uh, you know, actually coffee right. is like probably like five <clears throat> foot high or something like that. Um, it's kind of like grapes, you know, like it's like small little bushes. And then on top of that, you have the shade cover, um, the oak trees basically. And, and that's the wood that we get and that we use. So how, how do you continue to grow the business when you have a limited, obviously there's a limited source of that wood. It's not, yeah. you know, is it just always, you know, you can find other coffee plantations or do you yeah. have other sources? Oh, there's a lot. Um, even though it's a small country, I mean, it's just incredible. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know the numbers off my head, but I think it's like, there's like a hundred thousand hectares of coffee plantations or something like that. It's just like the numbers are like crazy, you know, and it's imagine the weather is all year round hot, uh, very humid. I mean, it just, uh, you know, it grows nonstop. It just doesn't stop. And so it's, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's a great uh, raw material, basically, um, to have. Now, when did you start um, introducing new products like the, um, the ones from Argentina, the, how do you say it, Corbac? Cor- Quebracho, Corbac, yeah. yeah. Quebracho, and then the eucalyptus. When did you start introducing those, uh, those types? Because those are not from 
El, Sal yeah. El Salvador. Yeah. So they're, they're from different locations. Yeah. And so um, the, some of the backstory behind that is um, so on some level, I like to please people, um, you know, uh, and it's something that I try to teach my employees, you know, always say yes, <laughs> you know, say yes first. And then, then we figure it out. And so, and you know, you can take it to far maybe, um, but, but um, so I've had, it's all started with the restaurants again. Uh, you know, this is like back in, uh, yeah, like very early on, 2010, 2011. Um, I, uh, here in Miami, we had uh, Brazilian customers, you know, Brazilian about, uh, steakhouses, uh, you know, those like uh, churras, churrascaria style, you know, with the uh, rodicio, the turning, mm -hmm. the turning uh, skewers and stuff like that. And uh, we had like Argentinian steakhouses and they're very proud, um, you know, about their heritage and they, they literally, they want to bring their, the entire experience, you know, a Brazilian steakhouse, they want you to have that experience. They want you to feel like you're in Rio de Janeiro, you know, at the beach uh, eating that steak. And so they want everything to be authentic. And so they asked me like, Sebastian, can you get me Brazilian charcoal? Sebastian, can you get me Argentinian charcoal? I'm like, sure you know why not I, i'll do uh, you tell me uh, you tell me to jump and i ask you how i right uh, and um yeah so i ended up bringing it and then over the years once we started uh, like pushing into retail i just thought you know i sat down and i thought about charcoal you know how how can we sell this you know what's the difference and i and i thought you know like how's this different than like like beer or so, you know, like an IPA, there's all these like different IPAs uh, or whiskey or so, you know, there's all these different whiskeys and, you know, and it comes down to, well, to some level performance and, you know, we can talk more about that, but also it's like flavor, you know, all these charcoals are made with a different wood. And, and even though when you, when you burn wood into charcoal, you're losing a lot of that, you know, um, those wood oils, essentially that, that are making, you know, like a, a fire taste like hickory or pecan or, or oak or something, you know, you, you lose a lot of that essence, let's say, but still it retains, uh, you know, I don't know, like a 10% or so of that essence of that wood that you're using and it has a certain aroma, a certain, I don't know, like soul, like a flavor to it, right? Uh, and so uh, I feel like our, the, our standard fogo from El Salvador compared to uh, Quebracho from Argentina, compared to the Brazilian one, there's different flavor profiles. And, um, and uh, you know, as, as people like different whiskeys, have different favorite whiskeys, different favorite beers, I just figured that, you know, why not offer to people all these differences and, you know, and they can pick whatever they like best. Um, and that's kind of, that's, that was sort of the entire idea behind that. Yeah, I, I kind of agree. I mean, there's, you know, people, you, you have to play to your audience and play to your customers. And if they're asking for certain things, and there are differences, I mean, I've used different charcoals, you can tell, especially if it's a different type of wood, it'll burn, you know, faster or longer or yeah. hotter or cooler. Um, so there's always even even if it's not that little bit of flavor, like you said, there's always some other principle of it or, um, you know, yeah, that that's going to be different from one to another. So um, Great. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so I, when you started growing, when you started introducing the retail part of it, <clears throat> how fast did it really start taking off? Um, not at all, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I Are had. You, did you start so, like just trying to sell to like um, you know charcoal, you know, you know, uh, to grilling stores or special no, stores? No. So, uh, so uh, uh, as I mentioned before, right. Um, I mean, either there was no strategy or, or, you know, the strategy didn't work out, but I guess there was a bit of a strategy at that point. So here we're talking probably like 2013, 2014. So I'm, I'm thinking, okay, we, we got the restaurants figured out. That's going good. But, you know, really to make this sort of like a more long-term thing to build a brand, let's go, we need to go into retail somehow. Uh, you know, the restaurants don't really care about what they're burning. You know, nobody looks at the back it's 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 more about the you know can somebody bring it to me 10 cents cheaper or something like that uh you know it, it becomes difficult um you know to to survive in that and and you know it's kind of fun to build a brand and yeah uh, you know to to build kind of your own thing and so i really wanted to push into retail but you know the traditional way into retail is i don't know to go you know i was in florida or i'm in florida miami so 
well, let's go to Publix, right? It's a Florida supermarket chain. Let's go, I don't know, to Whole Foods, to even to Walmart or so. I mean, you know, Google the biggest supermarkets in the United States and you, you, you write to them, you call them, you, you try to get a meeting. And, um, and I mean, I hit a lot of, and you know, this is standard, you know, like everybody will tell you that same story, you know, like it's not easy, you know, like, I mean, these people are not waiting for you to turn up in their office and be like, oh yeah, I got charcoal for you. Oh, I was waiting for you, you know, let's sell it. Um, you know, a lot of no's, right? Um, and, um, and so basically it kind of made me, and you know, uh, it kind of connects with what I said earlier, you know, I adapt. I, I like the adventure. I, I find kind of, you know, I'm a survivalist, let's say, you know, <laughs> I find my own way to make something work. And so I just figured that, you know, all these like thoughts started to combine, you know, it's like, okay, so I have these charcoals here that are essentially like uh, craft beer, you know, or like, uh, like whiskeys, you know, but maybe I'm talking to the wrong people, you know, I'm going to Walmart, I'm going to Publix and these guys, um, they are, they, you know, they're, they're probably just looking at this, um, you know, on a price basis or, uh, you know, they don't really understand the difference. You know, we talked about Kingsford. They're just thinking charcoal and like, oh yeah, I got a Kingsford and I got Royal Oak, you know, like what's these Fogo people? What's the difference? Why do I care? Right. And so, so that's kind of when I started thinking that I need to sell, I need to find the audience. I need to find the market here of people that are like me, right. That, they care about this, they care about the difference, that they care that this is all natural, that this is a better quality than, uh, you know, Royal Oak Lamb Charcoal, let's say, and, and you know, that are willing to pay, uh, you, you, you know, the money, the money for it as well, as well as, you know, where can I find these customers? Where are they shopping? And so that's kind of when, but almost again, almost like fell into my lap again, um, uh, I think what happened first was that Amazon reached out to us. So, you know, um, back in 2012, Amazon was still a website of mainly selling, um, you know, books and DVDs and, you know, lots of like small uh, light things. But they started to add more heavy stuff to their offering. You know, like they started looking at dog food. They started looking at, you know, charcoal in our case. And so they were building a charcoal category. So I can only imagine they must have gone to Royal Oak, they must have gone to Kingsford, but of course those guys are dinosaurs, you know, they were selling in every retailer in the United States. You know, they probably looked at Amazon and they were like, like we don't need you guys, like, who are you? Like, you know, we don't care, we're, we're in every retailer that there is. But so Amazon, you know, kept knocking on everybody's door, kept knocking, came knocking on our door. And, and even I, I said, like, what do they want? Sell charcoal online? They're crazy, you know, what they're talking about. And, and, and it was really my wife. My wife said, you know, just give it a shot. You know, why not? You have nothing to lose. And, and, and you know, initially I just thought they were crazy because they were buying, uh, I, think, I think the first order that Amazon placed with us was for like three bags. I was like, <laughs> these people are crazy. Like, what do they want? You know, like <laughs> these three bags are gonna get lost in the warehouse. <laughs> like, no, nobody's ever gonna buy this. Right. And then, um, you know, now we sell thousands of bags on Amazon, you know, a week. It's, it's, it's crazy. And really, that's what put us on the map. Right. So very quickly, as it was available on Amazon um, throughout 2013, um, we were also one of the only brands, uh, I think, if not the only brand that was available on Amazon at that time. You know, I guess everybody else had the same reservations that I had and said, you know, this is crazy. Nobody's ever going to buy this, you know, online, like who would want to do that? And so they basically, um, uh, it gave us sort of this opportunity to be in the showcase uh, where it really was only Fogo and we were gathering steam, right? Like we were gathering reviews um, and um, it kind of became clear after about a year or so on Amazon that a lot of these people buying the product were like big green egg uh, customers. And so I was like, what is this big unique thing? You know, like, who are these people? And so, you know, I started going into uh, uh, Facebook groups. Or I think this was like pre-Facebook groups, like forums back then. Um, you know, the, the, the big green egg forum uh, or egghead forum or whatever it's called. Um, and, and so because of the success on Amazon, then dealers became uh, aware of us. You know, uh, Roswell Hardware, a big dealer is now called Atlanta Grill Company. 
um, you know, one, one of the first dealers that picked us up. And so that gave us a bigger audience and it sort of just grew from there. You know, again, like I said, all organically and naturally, you know, more people bought online, more reviews, sign up a dealer, more people saw it. Some of those didn't want to buy it at that dealer. They, they went online and, you know, it's just sort of, it just spitballed from there basically. So um, how important do you think it was to have the premium on there? Premium charcoal. Yeah. And uh, I mean, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Not many people actually ask us about that. But um, so again, it was something that I created for restaurants. Uh, I had a restaurant ask me, I don't, li I don't like the charcoal you're bringing me. I'm like, what, why? What's wrong with it? And they said, like, it only has 50% big pieces. The rest is kind of, kind of, kind of like small pieces. I'm like, yeah, but I mean, <laughs> that's how it is, right? I mean, you make charcoal and if some of it breaks. You get some big pieces and some smaller pieces. I mean, every charcoal in the market is like that. But actually, as I, you know, like I said, like, I like to please people. So as I kept thinking about it, I was like, you know what? Why? Why is that like that? You know, why? why? So other people must have this issue, you know, that they only want big pieces. Or other people might say, you know, like, I only want the smaller pieces because, you know, every piece, you know, like, I've bought charcoal in, in supermarkets, um, you know, and there's a whole log in there. Like it's unmanageable. You know, you have a Weber, you, you're barbecuing at the beach on a park. You buy this like eight pound, eight pound uh, bag of charcoal and there's a log in there. Like, what are you <laughs> going to do? You know, it's just crazy. And so it kind of struck me that this is interesting. You know, this is where we can add like a differentiator to charcoal, you know, like a, a hundred thousand year old industry, you know, since the beginning of mankind, since we discovered fire, we're making charcoal basically. Um, and it's like, there's nothing in the market, actually with the exception of, of briquettes. I, I believe that is why briquettes are so popular because you know, they're uniform in size. They're, they're always the same shape, always the same size. Um, so it's just, it's something um, that people can work with, you know? And that's why for so long also lamb charcoal was so kind of not well regarded because people kind of said, yeah, but then you get a big piece. It takes too long to burn. It doesn't get hot. Uh, and then you have little pieces that burn up too fast. And then you have hot spots. I'm like, what are they talking about? You know, like, it doesn't have to be like that. You know, like, if I as a manufacturer do my job well, because I can, I can basically classify the charcoal in, uh, or, or, or pre-select it into just big pieces and medium-sized pieces, small pieces, dust, right? Like these machines, everybody has that basically. You just have to do it. There, there's no, there hasn't been a will in the industry, right? It's, it's charcoal is a commodity. How many containers do you want? How many ship loads do you want? Right. Nobody, nobody ever thought about it. You know, we were small enough to say, uh, okay, I only want big pieces. Yeah. But uh, how, how many, how many bags of big pieces do you want? Oh, just like a hundred bags. You know, we were small enough to not send the guy packing where, <laughs> where we're like, you know what, I'll do it for you. You know, it's going to be a bit more expensive because, you know, literally that's where also some of those uh, marketing phrases I put on the back came from literally handpicked. So I had a guy, picking it off the, the belt, right? Uh, like in the factory, like you need to imagine it, like the, the conveyor belt is running with all the charcoal, a guy is bagging it. And, and so I told one guy, just, just stand there and pick every piece that's about the size of your fist that you can grab like that. You know, like I want you to pick it up and put it in a bag, make me a hundred bags. The guy wants to buy a hundred bags. And that's how it started. <laughs> like you can't make it up. Um, and, and, and I think, I mean, that's, it changed the charcoal world a bit, you know, now, now, and I know it's one of your questions you have now, a lot of people started copying us on that and, and <laughs> trying to get a piece of the action basically, but you know, that's how it is. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the, the I guess the, I think there's um, some kind of quote out there that uh, one of the biggest things of, um, uh, uh, you know, people to flatter you, they, they copy what you do, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, they, you know, but uh, so the super premium is actually pretty much mostly big pieces. And the yeah. premium is, is your regular product that you yeah. always offered. Yeah, but it's, say, it's I, the same I, wood. It's just a different sizes. Yeah. It's uh, what I explained to, you know, passes on that con conveyor belt and people just picking it off. I mean, literally at the time of packing, every piece is that big piece. It just breaks over time. Right. So there's a lot of transport involved, you know, it gets put into a container, then it gets transported to the U S and I put it in another truck, gets to the store, maybe two or three guys, uh, you know, 
carefully <laughs> moving charcoal bags around and not so carefully, you know, and, and things keep breaking. And that's why I think I put like a, like a crazy formula on the bag. I think like 80% above four inches, you know, again, you know, I probably just came up with it one day and I figured, you know, it's got to be something like that. I, <laughs> I put your finger in the wind, but um, there's no, you know, there's no scientific explanation, but literally at the time of packing, um, if you come to our plant, it's all big. It's 100% big pieces. Right? And then it starts breaking down pretty much from there. Um, so I, I know because I, I have a ceramic grill and, and when, when people start buying a more expensive grill, whether it's a gas grill or whether it's a you know charcoal grill or, or what have you, uh, they start wanting to have more expensive you know, fuel. <laughs> so yeah. they want to use the best, especially like you said, the big green egg people. I mean, they're similar, you know, anybody that's going to spend a thousand or 1500 or $2,000 on a charcoal grill is going to want to use, you know, better quality stuff. They don't want to toss in, you know, a $10 bag of briquettes. That's, you know, you know not the optimal fuel for them. So, I mean, I can understand you're, you're, you're targeting that, that person that, wants to put something premium in his premium, you know, grill. So um, I can definitely see how that started growing and, and got you, uh, especially, you know, in, in Atlanta grill company, I know those guys, I know Gary and his brothers um, and deal with them too. So, um, but I can definitely yeah. tell that, um, yeah, that's kind of where your market is. You're not at the, your, your brand is not at the, you know, the, the Kingsford, you know, level of, just some guy who barbecues two times a year and, and just throws, you know, doesn't yeah. care what it is and throws lighter fluid on it and just cooks a couple of hot dogs, you know? Yeah. I think most the, of our customers, I, you know what? Uh, because that's another question I've been getting uh, quite a bit, right? Like who, who are your customers? Right. And uh, as you grow bigger, you kind of start thinking about that more. Yeah. Who are my customers? And uh, I would say, you know, uh, people have hobbies, right. And people uh, start in investing, you know, their time and money into their hobbies. And so I would say we're not like, like what you just said, right? We're definitely, we're not the charcoal and we're, we're not available. Uh, so uh, mass market, uh, you know, nationwide, let's say um, we're not that charcoal that, Oh, I need something to burn, you know, run to the next uh, grocery store or gas station or whatever and pick up a bag. You know, that's basically, you know, that's, we're more a, we are like a an hobbyist, you know, like a barbecue aficionado, backyard warrior, you know, like you said, that enthusiast. Has, yeah, yeah that has enthusiast probably out there, right? Probably not only one grill; it has probably three grills and at least a one thousand dollar grill. You know, it has some serious money and time invested into this hobby already, and then they're coming across Fogo. You know, it's it's a it's a progression uh, sort of thing. You know, they. They probably started with like a Weber and some Kingsford briquettes. You know, they learned about the the whole like snake technique and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, then they then they maybe uh, moved on to a pellet uh, smoker, got into smoking, and eventually they're like, you know what? I, I want charcoal. I want that like the real charcoal smoke. You know, let's buy a big neck, fifteen hundred dollars. Let's go all in. I'm serious. Um, you know, and that that's when they're like like what you said, right? That's that's when they're looking at okay, what's the best charcoal I can get. What are the best accessories to get for this thing? You know, and they also start caring more about their meat, right? Like, um, is Publix meat really so good? You know, where can I get better meat? Is, uh, you know, is uh, online uh, mail ordering meat, is that, is that worth it or not? Is that overpriced? Um, you know, is there a local butcher that I can get? Um, you know, things like that. You know, people really, that's what I'm saying. It's not just money, right? Like they start investing a lot of time, get on Facebook groups, get on forums, you know, really start uh, getting into this hobby basically. And yeah. um, I totally agree. The guy that um, doesn't really care that grills once or twice a year, that'll go buy a $50 cheap, you know, uh, grill at Home Depot, doesn't really care what he throws in it because he yeah. doesn't do it that often. He's not you know, he, he's the guy that'll look at a, you know, somebody that spends a thousand dollars on a grill and go, you're crazy. I can buy 150 of my $50 <laughs> crappy grills, but you know, that's the guy you look at and go, yeah, but I'll have this one for, you know, 30 years before I, have to, you know, even replace it. So. And use you know, it three times a week. And three, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And if it's, you know, I, I wouldn't have, you know, I've had crappy gas grills and, and, you know, cheap, you know, grills that have 
rusted out after, you know, two years. And, you know, sometimes you got to go with quality over quantity or, you know, just looking at price and the people that are, like you said, that aren't doing that, they're not going to look at Fogo and go, wow, 35, $40 a bag. That's crazy for charcoal. I can get, you know, two big bags of Kingsford for 10 bucks. And it's like, yeah, but it's like, <laughs> okay, you yeah. know, that's not the same thing. You know, you don't, uh, and you still have that in some of the groups, especially yeah. with new people that come in and then they're yeah. still learning about what they want to do. And then, um, you know, they'll, they'll look at anything and all they see is price right off the bat. And you can really start seeing a, a progression when they start looking at more quality of, of what they are actually using, like you said, with the meat and everything, you know, cause yeah, they'll see, you know, somebody's paying $35 for a, you know, a couple of ribeyes instead of $10 at their local, yeah. you know, uh, getting a, you know, the, you know, unro you know, no roll or, you know, just really cheap meat. And well, you start learning about all these things, right? Like yeah. you can, you can ask a barbecue aficionado, let's say, what's the spinalis? And they'll, they'll be able to tell you, you know, exactly. that's another test. You ask anybody else, what's the spinalis? Okay. Don't worry about Fogo. You know, like you'll get there eventually. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's kind of one of these things. Yeah. You know, you, you, you learn a lot of things, so different smokers, different techniques. Uh, you learn about the meat, you know, why do I, why should I worry about prime? What's the difference between prime choice and select or even higher than that, you know? And once you get into that, then you're ready to buy Fogo basically. <laughs> so you didn't start out being an aficionado. So have you, do you consider yeah. yourself an aficionado now? I mean, have you gotten into it where enough where it's not just a business to you? You really love doing it? Oh this yeah. Stuff? I love it. I love experimenting with new things. Um, I think for me, like the, my, my, my next personal challenge is uh, I kind of want to get into like, you know, like real sort of like Texas smoking, like an offset uh, smoker. Um, yeah, and I, I, the, good that you bring that up. You know, I'm basically living this out on my YouTube page. You know, it's a mix of providing sort of interesting content for our customers, the recipes and stuff like that. But I'm also constantly trying these new, uh, you know, trying to learn new techniques for myself. Uh, you know, like for example here, the, the one you have there, the pastrami beef ribs, you know, um, I had never done pastrami before. Uh, beef ribs is a great thing. Um, you know, I, I just wanted to try it. And so I do these videos, you know, it's, it's 50% learning for myself and 50% entertaining for our customers. And so <laughs> I don't want to listen to her, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but I've watched a few of your videos and I, I, you know, highly recommend that anybody that's um, listening that they check out the Fogo YouTube channel. Because I can really tell, it's one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on is because I watched a few of your videos and I can tell you really get into it. And it's not just a business to you. You get into cooking and, and you like experimenting with different things and you like learning how to cook and using your charcoal that you sell. So, I mean, that really, I think that's a really uh, good thing to have when you're, you're passionate about the product that you have and how other people can use it. Um, people can really, you know, see that in your videos and i think that uh, that's a great thing um you won't see the ceo of kingsford you know, <laughs> you know doing that and um you know you 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 are the ceo of this company and you're the one putting your face out there and you're doing this and showing people how to you use your product and they can see the excitement in your eyes when you you know are cooking this stuff and then your family's eating it so i mean that's, yeah. that's i really like that and uh as i said make sure you guys check out the fogo um the Fogo YouTube channel because he's got a lot of great videos on there and um, you can really tell he's passionate about what he's doing and thank then you, the, the food he's cooking. So, and uh, so let, let's talk about when you started and you're, you're partnering with these other businesses, like you said, Atlanta grill company and some of these others, and you started in Amazon. How important was that for you to grow the brand, to continue to partner, even when you started getting, um, you know, more popular? Yeah, you no, I mean, to continue to work with YouTube channels and other other people to yeah. spread spread the word out there as well, right? That that's that's been key, uh, uh, basically, you know. Um, and you know, if I can give, if anybody's listening or watching, um, you know, that has a small business or is thinking about growing a small business, I think that's the key nowadays. You know, collaborations, work with other companies uh, in your in your market in your industry. And, um, you know, leverage each other. Every, everybody has unique uh, talents and, um, you know, reach basically. And um, 
you know, uh, it's, it's such a noisy world, you know, like unless you're a really big company and have top, top marketing dollars, you know, millions of dollars to spend on like Facebook ads or, you know, there's no point even advertising on TV anymore who watches TV. But um, yeah, uh, you know, like you, you're not, you're not going to be heard, you know, uh, and, and so you got to find your niche and you got to, you, you want to, you want to partner up with, um, you know, other companies in your, in your industry, basically. And that, that really helps. How important is it for you to learn from your customers? Cause you're small enough that like, like you, when you started dealing with Atlanta grill company, I'm sure they gave you some kind of ideas on what their customers were looking for and how you guys could yeah. help fill that, that niche. Like you're saying, uh, how important is that to be able to be small enough to listen instead of being some big corporate conglomerate that just throws a product out there and just says, just take it or whatever. And, you no, know, and, and, and customer service, um, you know, um, I felt one of the early on, um, when I was looking in the forums, you know, what, what were people complaining about the experience with other charcoal brands? Um, you know, there was a lot of talk about, um, you know, finding rocks, uh, maybe charcoal sparking. And, and, you know, to be honest, it happens, you know, we talked about the, the process of making charcoal, you know, we, we just try, you can, you can just try to, to, to do the best possible job. Right. And so what I've seen is that, uh, what I mentioned before, up to a few years ago, things have changed now. And I guess, you know, to some extent, we, we have, uh, changed the industry, you know, being really small, but you know, we've kind of upped the game a little bit. And so everybody else had to follow. Um, but up to a few years ago, charcoal was like a super commodity, like the, especially the big guys, they didn't care. Like, oh, so what, you had a rock in your bag? What's your problem? You know, buy another bag. You know, like, oh, you had, you had a, a piece of insulation from the oven, uh, from the kiln in your bag? Yeah, so, so what? Clean out your, your firebox. Like, what, what are you talking about? You know, and stuff like that. It's, there was no customer service. They they just didn't care. But again, you know, I think that's where I sort of saw a niche. And I saw what you were saying, right? These guys have paid a thousand dollars or more for a grill, right? They do care. They don't want a, uh, too many rocks or nails or sparks in their bag. They care about that, and they're willing to pay a little bit extra for it. You know, they're willing to not pay uh, uh, fifteen bucks for a bag of oil oak, but maybe twenty five bucks for a, a bag of big unit charcoal or maybe fogo, right? And so that's why I said, or saw the opportunity and said, you know what? If we just listen to the customer and provide that, that service that, they're, that, they're, that they want, that they're looking for, that none of these other guys is giving them, you know, you know to your question, um, I think that's what we try to do too. And, and that's why I started writing on every bag as well that, you know, um, what does it say? Like 100% satisfaction guaranteed. Essentially, that if you get a bad bag, we'll change it for you. And you know why? Why? Why can I say something like that? Like these big guys must think I'm crazy. I'll, I'll break my business or so. But in a thousand bags, I get like one return or, or two returns. You know, it's it's nothing. 0.1%. And so, it's a cost of doing business. And you know, in our case, because we're doing a good job, it's small. You know, you yeah. can get away with uh, with doing that. And your customer cares, and your customer is looking at you as a brand to take care of them. And if you do that, they'll love you. And then that's the yeah. thing. Yeah. They're not just, you know, Oh, well, I'll just go buy another crappy bag of Kingsford or Royal Oak, you know, yeah. um, they, don't, they don't care. They're not going to send me another bag, but um, let's talk about dealing with competition. It seems like in the last couple of years since Fogo kind of came on the scene and started showing yeah. people how to do it, you've had some other competitors come out or even some other established charcoal companies start kind of offering some <laughs> premium offerings, you know, yeah. And then uh, there's you know, a Royal Oak XL now. I don't yeah. know. Or you got B &B. Looked at it. <laughs> you got B and B now they have different <laughs> levels of charcoal. You've got, you know, a uh, jealous devil coming out there trying nipping at your, your heels, trying to do something similar. But yeah. some of them are also trying to look at and go back to the, the other side, you know, by offering briquettes and, and other things as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, what do you think of the, the, the competition out there and what makes you still different from what they're doing? I mean, it's basically um, a bit of a summary of our conversation so far, right? Um, you know, I've never, this, this business wasn't uh, established out of some business school business plan and, you know, 
trying to grow to hundred million dollars and, and sell it uh, to, to a venture capital or something like that. You know, pretty much uh, this started as a family business to put some food on the table, to pay the bills. And thankfully, um, you know, through making good decisions and, and, you know, like what you were saying, listening to our customers and, and, you know, trying to, to fix the issues that our customers were having, you know, we did a lot of things right, let's say, right. And, um, and, and the other thing that we talked about is that essentially Fogo is an extension of me, you know, and my wife always says it to me, you know, she calls me like, you're, you're Mr. Fogo because essentially the way Fogo portrays itself, Fogo is sort of as a brand, is a lot like me. Um, uh, you know, and, and like you, we mentioned the YouTube channel and stuff like that. And, and so, I mean, uh, you know, competition, you, you know what? Uh, barbecue as an industry, and you know, so that's another thing we talk about, is growing tremendously. You know, like, I mean, look at the industry now and compare it to 10, 15 years ago. You know, I mean, it's just crazy uh the amount of innovation almost you know you think of barbecue industry and it's like innovation what are you talking about but i mean there were no pellet grills or, or you know maybe there were right i think uh, yoda existed like 20 years ago but you know it, it wasn't like an industry right now like kind of traeger blew that up and put that you know on, on the big map uh you know becoming like a massive sort of company uh you know pellet grills um really uh, okay, the, the Big Green Egg started growing a lot, um, you know, in the last uh, 10, 15 years. But I would, I would almost argue the, the, the entering of Kamada Joe as a serious competitor and a very aggressive competitor kind of, kind of made that category explode even more, you know, than, than, than it was just by itself, you know, with the Big Green Egg. And so generally speaking, the, and what I was mentioning too, I think we went from Barbecue being sort of a thing that you associated, you had like nice childhood memories about, oh, your dad made barbecue uh, hamburgers and sausages and stuff like that. But if you wanted a real barbecue, you would go to a restaurant and maybe order a brisket, right? Um, it kind of evolved from that to being like a major hobby, hobby of, a, of a part of the population, basically. You know, um, I mean, literally I have friends that, that go biking, right? And like I asked my friends, like, what are you doing this weekend? And like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna ride my bike 150 miles down to the keys. I'm like, really? <laughs> like, but why? <laughs> and and he's like, Yeah, man, I, I just got this bike. Don't even ask me how much I pay for it. It's like, how much you pay for this thing? It's like twelve thousand dollars. Like, twelve thousand dollars on this bike? Are you crazy? <laughs> and and they're like, Well, how many grills do you have? And I'm like, Well, like ten or so. What's the average price of your grills? Well, a thousand dollars. Like, I see you have a ten thousand dollars worth of grills in your backyard. And like, okay, <laughs> like, okay, I get it. Um, and so I think that's something that has happened. Um, you know, that in general, you know, um, a bunch of trends over the last couple of years. You know, like healthier, healthier living, healthier eating. You know, like the whole whole foods thing. You know, organic food, um, lifestyle. You know, there's a lot of more lifestyle sort of industries uh, uh, going on in barbecue. Sort of one of them, basically. Um, and like all these things have just come together basically. And it's just, it's just, you know, I want to use the word exploding. I think if some, some people look at the, the number of the growth is maybe not, not quite exploding, but it's growing, you know, it's, it's a, it's a good amount of growth. Let's say in an industry you think is, it's like stable and dead. Oh yeah. Growing. And I've talked to several, you know, my guests before just about just in the last 10 years, how the backyard cooking and you know barbecue grilling what have you has changed in the technology everything has to have bluetooth and wi-fi now <laughs> you know you got to have a controller to you know and 10 years ago you, you never even would have thought of yeah. having something to control your you know big green at your charcoal grill to yeah. control the temperature like you would your oven so i mean all that kind of stuff and the different types of grills that are out there and that keep being released i mean some of the you yeah. know uh, you know stuff from around the world like a, a lot of the argentinian type pizza grills is big yeah yeah the, the pizza like ovens that. everybody yeah. wants that stuff yeah. everybody wants yeah. something new out there and we're going to talk about that too dealing with what's going on right now and the current uh, situation with the COVID and all that, how it's affected your business. But, you know, I, I'm just from talking to a few people that are in the business, you know, either with grills or, or, or one way or the other, it's actually, 
you know, increased their, um, their business because people are cooking more at home and getting more into it. And, you know, besides, you know, having you know, some of the issues with the supply chain, um, you know, getting shut down in China or what have you, they can't get the product in, but people are buying it as well. Um, I've got some American manufacturers like Hasty Bake, they build all their own grills and they're having a hard time keeping up yeah, yeah. because people are buying them. Are you having any kind of issues getting supply of charcoal? Because I've heard that, you know, they're no, starting, um, they're starting to have okay. issues in some of the stores now. I mean, people yeah, are... I think it's the same. Um, goes back to that, that to some extent we're, we're small, right? Um, it's, it's much easier to, to double your sales or triple your sales or something. If you're small, you know, like how is a, Kingsford going to triple their sales, you know, like that would mean in their case, like three, you know, three production plants or something like that, you know, just to say, you know, like, how are you going to go from one plan to two to three, you know, it's impossible, you know, these things take time. But for us, it, it was like, okay, you go from, I don't know, having like a battery of uh, 10 sort of kilns, you know, you take a month, you, you build another 10, and then you take a month, you build another 10, you know, it's, since it's not as industrialized, it's not like a massive scale, you know, it, you know, we could react fairly fast to it. And again, you know, being small, you sort of nimble. You're like, oh, you want more? Sure. Um, <laughs> you know, you just sort of react to it. So I guess, you know, again, we, we kind of got lucky. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, I mentioned that, you know, 60% uh, of our business used to be to restaurants. Uh, uh, really important, really. Uh, I would say the restaurants have you know, build this company and kept it running on a daily basis, you know, just because it's so consistent, uh, the, or was so consistent, the demand from the restaurants, you know, day after day, week after week, all year round. Whereas, you know, um, you know, even though our customers tend to grill all year round, there's a sort of seasonality to it, um, to some extent. And, um, and that really has changed. Uh, I mean, restaurants are having a terrible time you know, some, some of the restaurants we, we uh, deal with, they, they already told us they're, they're going bankrupt. They're not opening again. Others are just doing takeout, um, you know, operating a, at a third or so of their capacity. You know, it's, it's very difficult right now. Um, but of course, you know, people continue to be eating, you know, and instead of eating out, instead of going to restaurants, they're eating at home. And so that's why you see that, um, that sort of like the, 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 the barbecue market having blown up a lot. Um, you know, again, probably not everybody when, uh, uh, you, you know, in, in April kind of looked, uh, looked online and said, Oh, I'm buying a Kamado Joe or big Unique or, you know, Yoda smoker or something like that. You know, like you don't jump all in into like a 1500 to $2,000 grill. But, um, but if you were sort of already on the trajectory, you know, mm. you maybe, you maybe, uh, you know, dabbled a little bit with it, you thought about it, you know, those people probably jumped right in, you know, be kind of before their time, you know, before they were really ready. And, 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 and I, and I think it's going to stick, you know, uh, somebody told me that it takes like, I don't know, like 60 days or so to, to create a habit. You know, it's been five months, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just hoping, you know, a lot of this is going to stick mm -hmm. and uh, people are going to continue using that new grill that they have in the backyard and, and it's going to continue. Usually, uh, so I go to a lot of like uh, grill events, you know, or egg fest and things like that. And people usually ask me, you know, like, oh, why should I buy Fogo over this other charcoal? And um, in kind of my answer has already been, uh, we, we talked about it in the last hour, but uh, essentially what I say to people is they should just give it a try, right? Like uh, we talked uh, uh, on the beginning of the call about different, different styles of cooking, different cookers, um, you know, people use it in different ways. And we talked about flavor, right? And that's, so that's basically my answer to most people, you know, like, um, you know, I mean, I think Fogo is one of the best charcoals out there, but you have to find, find the best that fits your needs, you know, fits your cooking style, fits your flavor profile, you know, try them out, give it a go. You know, if it works for you, great. If you like the taste of it, great. If not, you know, keep looking. Um, you'll, you'll find the, the best one for you. And that's sort of, that's what I usually tell people. Yeah. And that's, that's good. I mean, you can uh, definitely tell that, um, like I said, you, you're passionate about it. And that's what I like is that you, 
you know, you're not just some corporate guy that's, you know, I'm just selling charcoal, you know, that charcoal, it's a commodity. <laughs> you want to buy it. You actually sure. have a passion for it. And I can tell, like I said, that's why, you know, check out the Fogo um, YouTube channel, check out the Fogo website. And you can just really tell that um, Sebastian really puts, um, puts a lot into it. And that, that really yeah. means you care, you care about your customers, you care about your product, you care about your business and you know, it's, you treat everything like, like family. So that's, uh, yeah. that's great. So, I want to thank you again for being on. If, if there's anything else you want to, anything else that's uh, Fogo's got coming up, anything new coming down the pike or anything like that? No, right now, um, uh, you know, we're literally running uh, to make sure that um, we get all the orders out. Um, you know, so far, so good. We've been, you know, lucky. Uh, I think there's no major wait times, no major lead times. Um, we pretty much ship everything the same week, you know, that we, that we get the orders. Um, but yeah, for now, I think this is also a little bit of uncertainty. You know, we talked about like how long is this going to continue? I think this is going well into 2021, possibly longer. You know, we've established, uh, new habits, um, that are going to be with us for years. Um, but you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm also a conservative sort of guy, right? I don't like jumping into the unknown or going, doing crazy things. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in a holding pattern right now, you know, let's see. Let's see what happens next sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, you built a great brand and I don't think you're going anywhere. I think if anywhere you're going up, you just don't know how fast you're going to go yeah. up and how, how far. So, um, but yeah, thank, uh, you. thank you. you definitely put a, uh, built a great brand over the last few years and I'm sure it's going to continue, but I want to thank you again for being on and um, uh, I will make sure that everybody checks out your website and you, they can buy it on Amazon as well, or um, any yeah. upscale uh, barbecue um, outdoor yeah. grilling place, I'm sure. Ace Hardware nationwide now. Um, we're nationwide in Ace Hardware stores. If they don't have it in the store, you can request it to the store and they will carry it um, or even okay. deliver it to your home, I think, as Ace Hardware does. So I'll link your website and the uh, YouTube channel in the description below as well. So they can, they can check it out and see how passionate you are about your charcoal. But <laughs> thanks again. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you so and, much for uh, having me. All righty. Thanks again. And we'll see you on the next Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. Thank you. Hey, all, I want to thank Sebastian Bessert from Fogo Charcoal for being on again. Make sure you check out the Fogo YouTube channel, the Fogo website. You can find Fogo Charcoal on Amazon and your local Ace Hardware. <laughs> Thanks for joining me and follow us on the Fire and Water Cooking YouTube channel, Facebook page, group. Make sure you subscribe to the Fire and Water Cooking podcast. I'll see you on the next one.